last time on Worlds Asunder. Don't worry, we're just recording all of this. Can I help you? We just heckle me more, so it takes longer. We can do a blooper reel. You're welcome. Oh, yeah, no, it's, this is definitely going in one of the outros. <laughs> The stories we've read capture our attention and immerse our minds in settings of all kinds to bring us the spectrum of feelings and deliver the tale of tales to our starving psyches. Whether it's medieval style fantasy with mages and knights, or hard sci-fi takes on the future of space colonization, or thrillers set in your backyard, world building is the foundation that holds up the narrative the glue that keeps it from unraveling as readers follow the journey you laid out for them, all to make the stories jump from the pages and burn themselves into our memories. Welcome, weary writers, to Book Career in a Year's network of podcasts. This is Worlds Asunder, an insightful podcast on world and character building. My co-host is the one and only David Shadoin, better known as Shady. It's not just a descriptor, it's also his moniker. And she's the H.Y. Gregor, but you can call her Haley or Sour Patch, your friend post-apocalyptic wasteland elf. We know, we know. We have nearly a score of published novels and short stories between us, but who the hell are we to teach you about world building and character development? We get it, which is why we decided to call in some favors. Each week, we pull from a list of the best and brightest authors, editors, and publishers to give tips and guidance on tackling the age-old questions and provide you with tools on how to accomplish world building like the pros. From environment to magic to characters, how do we strike a balance between what matters to our audiences and what matters to keep it all straight? Open up your ear holes and your minds and get ready for us to tear worlds asunder. So if you're ready, just knock and enter. Um, so for, for urban, san, fan, urban fantasy settings specifically, sorry, um, when you, you talked about how you were drawing from your memories of driving through certain settings when you were younger, um, and you have had people say, oh, this gas station wasn't built until this year, um, where is the line as far as how much research you do uh, to try to get like setting accuracy for real world places? Google map is my friend. Also, Tools and traits. I also really miss Google Earth. Which, oh, because they're kind of they're not different anymore, are they? Right. Well, Google Earth kind of gave you uh, a, like a almost like a three D view. Mm -hmm. And so let's just say I spent a, enough time looking at Cheyenne Mountain that I'm probably on yet another list. No, you're still on the same list. It was just now you have two agents instead of one. Agent Johnson, and special agent Johnson. Yeah. <laughs> I used to be able to see Cheyenne Mountain from my bedroom window in, in Colorado Springs. It was right there. And actually, I had someone tell me that they actually had been like hiking on the path that was used by some of the characters oh. up in there. Like, you know how it, the paths go up in Colorado State Park? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or I think that's what it's called. Yeah. I, think it's I think it's Cheyenne State Park is the one the just north of the Army Base. Yeah. Yeah. But it's like, they're like, oh, yeah, I've been on the trail that you talk about there. So do you ever like interview people or talk to people who live in the settings, try to find that kind of thing to, to help? No. Um, recommend it? If you have access to it, yes. Okay. Another reason why I, for a lot of stuff, I stuck to either areas that I could easily find access to or that I had experience with. For example, the uh, side trip to Russia, I was able to follow every step on Google Earth. So you knew exactly where they were. Yes, I knew exactly where, where they were, what road they had to cross. And his, and his side trip through Kansas, he definitely didn't go do that. Definitely used Google Earth. I'm sure we've all driven through Kansas at some point in our life and regretted it. <laughs> Am I lost? No, this is Kansas. It's still in America. It still keeps going. Three days later, we're still in Kansas. As I wear a Nebraska shirt over here. Yeah. It's just as bad. <laughs> so one of the things that I, I know, so Google Earth, Google Maps, they can, it can only get you so far also. Right. Um, so you can go into places where I, I know that I have done this, where I used Google Earth to 
uh, write a scene and then actually visited the site later and said, oh no, this place is it's not big enough, right? I didn't, you know, I didn't have the scope. Um, do you have advice as to how much we should trust um, Google Earth? Or is it easier to be less specific about the places you're writing about? If, if you're not certain, it's easier to be less specific. Okay. Um, now, for example, in one book, you know, I have a spot in uh, Northern Ireland that was another Google Earth research. But again, I was able to like literally take the camera down the road to like the bar that Lehman Pixel go to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the area that, that uh, Grianne first appears. Uh, Conveniently, I got to go to uh, the Scottish Highlands to personally visit the kickoff for book five. Research, it's a write-off. Research, that's a write-off, yeah. Uh, one thing, though, um, I did find when doing real-world locations is, and I didn't do this in the first book as much, but later books I, I adhere to pretty strictly, is uh, avoiding most real-world business names. So into that a little more. And so, for example, actually, I refer to like Pizza Hut and Subway in book one. Mm -hmm. And I think that the last time I refer to a real business, I file off the serial numbers. Mm -hmm. Do you do that for other things as well? Um, not just businesses, but um, if you're talking about a, a specific website or um, a brand, like a clothing brand, or are there other things that you need to worry about or consider when you're writing in that? The general rule is if, if you're not being d defamatory, you're probably okay. Mm -hmm. But... It's easier if you have something you can make a, a convenient like analog. Um, and for one thing, like if something goes wrong with that brand later after you've written the book, mm -hmm. you know, like there's some big scandal or they just like, you know, disappear off the face of the earth. Well, and there are certain legalities that um, involve lyrics and song titles and those kinds of things mm -hmm. as well. So when you're trying to make real world comparisons, because in urban fantasy, you have that you have the leisure to do that, where in some science fiction or in traditional fantasy, you don't, right? Right. Um, but those are things that all kind of have to be thought through a little bit. Right. You have to be careful with that because you can run into copyright issues. Mm -hmm. um, and it varies. So I don't, I don't use any, like, lyrics. I think I reference one band by name, Here Come the Mummies. Oh, they're great. They're, they're basically a, 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 horns, a horns and brass band that uh, play dressed up as mummies. They're, they're, they're all session musicians who are under contract, can't appear on stage the, as themselves. With their faces? So they have to dress up to do it. And they actually, Puri is one of the areas they tour in. Cool. That's very Daft Punk with the obscured identities. Yeah. Or uh, what's the, the other big band that does that? Hollywood Undead, I think. Do they wear masks? Yeah, it's, it's one of those bands. I'm, trying, I'm pretty it's sure it was Hollywood Brown Undead. Classy. Yeah. <laughs> They were, and, and it worked. It worked for them to to be able to like change members. Exactly. Stuff, yeah. Right? And the mummies, I know they rotate characters now, probably like on depending on who has gigs, stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. All so, I can think of though is that Scooby Doo's about to bust out onto one of their shows, and it's, all right, it was Mr. Jenkins, and then it's like they pull the wrong mask off. Right, right. Anyway. <laughs> we digress. Um, yeah. But but with that, so urban fantasy, you have the luxury to do you know pop culture references mm -hmm. and stuff. Do you, do you avoid those similarly because you're worried about dating the book or do you love adding those? What? I, I like sneaking in Easter eggs. Okay. Um, and actually I kind of broke character for Liam because I had him use a, a Star Wars reference when he's really uh, pop cultural illiterate mm -hmm. and he's a bit of a technological Luddite, but he did use the, uh, the, the, the uh, did you just, these aren't the droids you're looking for, my boss? Yeah. I remember that. Speaking of him being a, a Luddite, uh, you talked about how for world building, when you get into it, science fiction technology is your main focus, and right. it's magic for fantasy. But with urban fantasy, you have the integration of the two. Right. Right. So what, what kind of things did you look at for that when you were building your series? Because we've seen it done a lot of different ways in different urban fantasy. Right. You know. Like, for example, in Harry Potter, you know, magic tends to make technology go wonky. Mm -hmm. well, I didn't want to do that. And actually, there's times where I actually tie in magic and technology together. Mm -hmm. For example, when the Celestials communicate to people, like Lee, you know, all of a sudden the, the news show changes and newscasters are talking to him out of the TV. Yes. <laughs> um, but also I wanted to make Liam a bit technologically backwards because with any character, they need stuff they're not good at. Right. 
Well, and then you even used it, you took it a step further, um, because just beyond the, the newscasters, you also have your, your data rights, right? Mm -hmm. So that was a really unique thing that, that combined several elements of the world. And I, I thought it was really interesting. Would you expand on kind of where that idea came from? And Well, so, so if you know, magic is gone from the world, how did Pixel and Enar get there? How are they able to move around without getting caught? Well, that means that there are infiltration missions. And as we know in modern day, it's kind of hard to get around without, you know, some, some, some sort of ID or something, some numbers. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, there has to be someone forging these IDs. Well, then it's like, well, okay, these have to be aspects of a, a trickster, trickster god or trickster figure. Yes. So in fact, the, uh, the data rights are referred to as Loki, Loki and Gwydion. Now, those may just be handles. Right. <laughs> but, you know, it, convey, it conveys the idea. I love that, fairy handles for, for hacking. <laughs> Um, so are there other things like that that you try to exploit that make it really unique where you're taking, you know, fantasy elements and plastering them on top of like the real world stuff? Other things that you look for specifically for ideas? Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything I've done as far as an interesting interaction. Um, oh, yeah. Well, there's a scene where a place that was magically secure gets infiltrated because someone drilled a hole in the wall to run a wire. It's a loophole that no one thought about. Exactly. You know, they literally drilled a hole through their wards to run this cable, and so something came in through the cable. Mm -hmm. So that's a really unique thing that you run into for this genre specifically. Well, and I love that yeah. because it is very, like, again, coming back to the fact that your novels are very character-driven, right? And so it is that right there, when, when you're looking at kind of a world-building aspect, is a really brilliant way to show these characters primarily think in one sort of system and function. And if they're so used to magic, getting the thing done, or they're, they're so worried about magic, they completely forgot about the old spy trick, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Like, th that to me is just a, another piece of that, that building around your character plot. Well, and they're being directly impacted by the world in a totally unique way for the genre, and then they're forced to adapt to it. Right. Is, yeah. It also goes back to you have to make sure that you don't make your magic or in science fiction technology infallible. Yeah. And that's probably a whole other, we could probably do a whole podcast on like power leveling and oh, yeah. looking at that, which is not so much a world building thing, but. I'm sure we will at some point. Yeah. If you want to see a power leveling podcast, let us know in the comments. Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> get it in there um, because there are, there are a lot of things I mean power leveling you run into like environmental struggles and that kind of ties into your your magic right, right? where they interact sometimes with the weather exactly and how does that go do you use actual weather patterns to determine some of those things or point it out as an anomaly yes um, in fact the uh, scene with the tempest elemental mm -hmm. because in Illinois weather tends to move a certain way and then when all of a sudden it starts going backwards, like when a storm had just passed through, it's like, wait a minute, there's something hinky going on. Yeah. Where, <clears throat> so where do you start drawing, you know, weather, weather is one of those fun things, right? It is both environment and a plot device and also can be a character. So when you came up with the you know, your, your Tempest Elemental. Like, where are you drawing that, uh, that piece of world building from? Well, weather has always had a kind of a, a supernatural aspect for ancient cultures. You know, I mean, even like, you know, as kids, you probably heard that like it would rain or is angels crying. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's our modern version of it. Yeah. Whereas, you know, in the old days, you know, the storms were the, the fury of Thor or Zeus. And also, because I established that there are elementals and, and elemental spirits, then it's like, well, okay, if there's like wind spirits, why couldn't there be a storm spirit? And how could someone exploit that? Mm -hmm. It's funny because the way you described it, the only thing I can think of is the Hercules scene where they release the Titans and one of them's the, the spinning wind. Oh, yeah, the, the cyclone. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, it, and, and the way you describe it is much more, right? It, it is all of the things, but that, that is like the immediate reaction is I go, oh, yeah, it's the, the tornado that went through and is now moving weather wherever it wants. But 
Um, okay, so for, for urban fantasy specifically, mm -hmm. when it comes to people who are maybe newer authors who are trying to develop a world for their stories, do you have any, what, what would be like your top two do not do tips? Do you, do you think that there are any like really common issues that people run into or, you know, roadblocks that they hit? Probably one of the things you have to get really careful about is when you involve any sort of contemporary religion. I mean, I've gotten some hate and one-star reviews because people pick up the book, they read the back jacket, and they're like, oh, he hates Christians. You know, when in fact, my publisher and my main beta reader for, for the first book were both Catholics. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you know, there was like one line that got changed because my beta reader was like, you know, this comes across, you know, and she explained to me like, you know, how someone would take it. And I was like, oh. Okay, I could see that, and then I changed it. So that, that fine line between making the world realistic so it's recognizable, but also not, like... That's why, for example, the, I, I, I'm very specific that the Avramites are not just all Christians. Mm -hmm. They're a specific, like, sect that's operating in, to uphold the Accords. Well, and you also, this is totally tangential to that, but... Um potentially relevant workarounds that you're looking at for things that maybe are a little more controversial. Um, you have good guys, quote unquote, that are still part of the, you know, the celestial camp. Yes. You know, so you haven't totally, you know, villainized the whole. And that, that's important because, and even like, you know, my, my you know, antagonist, um, two of them, I would say, get uh, at least, you know, some sort of like redemption or closure at the end. Mm -hmm. You know, at, the, at the end of the uh, uh, A Tangled Fate, you know, my beta reader's like, okay, that scene with Redacted made me cry. In the hospital? No, the other one. Tangent again. Yeah, tangent again. Yeah. Although the hospital is, is the other one I was talking about. Okay. And I, I have really enjoyed reading these books, and so this is fun getting to just kind of interview Oz and pick his brain a little bit about how, how he's built it all. Um, because you've taken this huge, I mean, so really right now you've focused a lot on, and talked about Irish specifically, mm -hmm. threw in a little bit of the Norse, um, but you have opened it up with the way that you've written the world for a huge amount of growth, right? right. Um, and so not only do you have other aspects of the real world, like other places physically that people are going to be able to go and visit, but you've got all of this other mythology. Right. Um, you know, the different corners of the world. So when you were originally building the, the world, how did you plan on addressing those things? So I knew the mythologies I wanted to deal with. Mm -hmm. And I also knew that I wanted to leave plenty of space for other people to play. So I, I used, I, I refer to two kinds of world building when you first start. Worm's eye, which means you start focused and close to your, your, your character or characters. And your players or readers only see as much as those characters see. Mm -hmm. Bird's eye is you take, you're up above, and you take a much broader view. And so for this, I use a bird's eye view. So I wanted a big sandbox, but if I cover it with sandcastles, there's no, no room for anyone else to play. So, so in your book then, um, and this is world building for novices. So like I said, it's a great sort of starter um, but every chapter is, it digs down into some of the things. So uh, technology and magic, races and cultures, which we didn't touch on almost at all. Um, but in urban fantasy, that's really cool because you have things that we're familiar with here. And then you have all of your, the, the varied, um, you know, fae and creatures and right. yeah, which have all of their own cultures and things. And exactly. then they start integrating and trying to figure out how to interact with humans, you know, in a totally different world. Um, so we touched a little bit on the, you know, politics and religion. Um, we didn't hit so much. I mean, war and economics, you're, you're trying to avoid some of that because what? of the genre. I do touch on both of those if you look at the whole challenge as a war. Mm -hmm. But that's yours. Right. War with champions. Yeah. Yes. Now, I have like in, in my list of things that, <clears throat> that I've thought about is, okay, how are th would things like, you know, if magic comes back to the world, you know, how would that affect things like war? Mm-hmm. What if all of a sudden, you know, th different sides could field supernatural champions? What if those supernatural champions were different based on their source culture? Mm -hmm. That's it. So, hint, hint for, for someone out there, that is a very fertile potential playground. 
um, so, so when you are building a, a new world, yes. um, what kind of considerations should people be thinking about how, they're, how it's going to impact the characters? How, how much should the world itself be shaping your characters, their relationships, and their interactions? If you're describing stuff in the world, it should impact the characters or the story. Okay. Because you know, even if they don't directly impact the character, they can like drive a general the general conflict, or you know, create obstacles. Mm -hmm. um, do you do you have any advice? Uh, we talked a little bit about how sometimes, uh, and partially probably people who do have a, a gaming background. Um, get so excited about building the world, talking about the magic system, the clothes, the cultures. Um, when do you say this is enough and decide that you're ready to actually shift into drafting or outlining or you know your next step? That is a very slippery rabbit hole. Yeah. Because world building is fun. And you know, I've been guilty of like spending like you know months working on, on a world and it's like, okay, am I gonna you know get around to writing in this or having someone play in it? Um, there's one uh, world that's referenced in here, my uh, alt history spell punk colonial America. Coming soon from Three Ravens Press. <laughs> well, a story, not a, not a book yet. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and Rob would probably skin me if I uh, didn't give him first crack at it. So. That's true. <laughs> that's fair. But um, that started off as a book idea, and... I came up with the basics of the world and I ended up with like, you know, probably about 20 pages of notes in a notebook. And I'm like, oh, I'm never gonna get around to writing this. I'm like, but I could flesh out the world by running it as a D and D game. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. Hmm. That's really cool. And then as the players like moved around in the world and interacted with different stuff, that kind of forced me to like, okay, how does that impact this? You know, how how would characters feel about that? You know, what's the history of this thing that I just wrote a paragraph about two years ago? <laughs> and where did I save that in my world Bible? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Control F. Um, so uh, with that, we, we talked a little bit, you said the difference between science fiction and, and urban fantasy is that sci-fi, you can make up a lot of things and there's less scrutiny. Do you feel the same way about the differences between urban fantasy and tra traditional fantasy? Or, yes. you know, epic fantasy? Yes. Um, in fact, with... Uh, Epic fantasy or, or standard fantasy, however you want to call it, um, I think that's even easier than science fiction because, yeah, there, there's, you know, there depends on how much science you have in your science fiction. Mm -hmm. For example, in the Four Horsemen universe, uh, the ships, you know, actually use relativistic thrust. You know, so most ships can't go over 5Gs because it'll, like, splat the crew inside. You know, we don't have, we don't have artificial gravity in the 4HU um, because we're not shooting TV shows in it. Yet. Um, so the characters, you know, can float around if a ship's not under thrust, and it also takes that, you know, comes into play in things like combat, me uh, medical issues. Hmm. The um, kind of along those lines. So, you know, you say you say it's a little more difficult, and this, you know, we'll probably dive into this a little more down the road too, but. You came up with a couple different planes of existence, essentially, and, and I think you describe it maybe slightly differently. But how did you go about, you know, building out <clears throat> these these three other kind of areas where beings can exist? And then how did you come up with the essentially the world forts? So the there's always been well not always but like as far as like the legends for the uh, the the she and the trois de nan. You know, there's this, you know, always this concept of an underworld or other world. Um, you know, when they refer to fairy mounds in Ireland, those are the doorways to the fairy world. Okay. Um, so that means there had to be another world, you know, basically layered with ours. Uh, so since I knew that all the magical folk had to be exiled somewhere, that made sense. Hmm. And having it physically mirror our world keeps it a bit grounded. I mean, if you're going to do a magical world, you know, it should have rules. And okay, so for example, the Rocky Mountains in the Glasswald are in the same place as they are in, the, in our world, the Dunwald. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the Merkwald is more kind of a cross between dreamwalking and the astral plane. Where I wanted somewhere to be able to, that people could like spirit travel um, and for spirits to, to dwell 
And then when I came up with the idea for the Umbra and the, the Deep Umbra, those are, or maybe like just kind of extensions of the Merkwald. So, and we see that dealt with in the books where there's, there's you know, creatures from the Umbra and, next, and uh, someone gets threatened to get thrown into the Deep Umbra at one point. And it's, they're described as the hungering darkness. And so every, um, the basis, because there are all of those different worlds that you've built into Malaysian, they all have their own sort of subcultures of, you know, creatures and races that right. you run into. So, and that's so like the, the Merkwold or um, the Deep Umbra, obviously darker, scarier, don't go there without a light kind of a thing, don't go alone. Right. See the shadow lands over there, Simba? You must never go there. <laughs> and the, the idea, the basic concept behind them is that, you know, we perceive our world as three dimensions, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, math postulates there's a, you know, a lot more dimensions. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, what if there's other worlds that are just like one dimensional notch off ours? Mm -hmm. That's also where I got the idea for things like elf pockets. Which are? Which are, so we see this, this is a common trope, like uh, the modern examples, anime. Mm -hmm. The interdimensional hammer. Where, you know, some character will reach into a bag and pull out this huge mallet that's twice as big as they are. Unlimited bag of holding. Exactly. And so I, I wanted a way for characters to be able to uh, hold, transport, or hide stuff. And so I'm like, well, if we have all these different dimensions and you can use magic, why can't you just use magic to kind of tuck something into an adjacent dimension? Yeah. And it would have to be something that could follow, follow you around. Exactly. Yeah. Well, there, there's, there's two kinds of, of elf pockets. There's ones that are, that are bound to a person and ones that are bound to an object. Well, and then that you also took that a step further because it impacts travel, right? right. So they have ways to go other places that are sometimes a little bit faster. Right, back to your question about wild forts. Mm -hmm. So I needed, I needed a way to get through, you know, from world to world. Mm -hmm. And so the, the easy shortcut became, well, there has to be some sort of portal. And I may have been inspired by, I think it was Charles DeLint had something called the tween, where like, they were like spaces like between, like, like if you went between trees or something like that, yeah. and you knew the, the, the right magic, you could step from our world to the next, or step from one tween to another. And th is that the term that they use in Pern as well, when the, the dragons go between? Is that what it's called? Because they do something similar. I'm not sure, I've never read Pern. Okay. Yeah, it's been a long time. I'm rereading it right now, and I should remember. Our um, experts are upstairs right now. We can ask them. Yeah. The trade-off is I didn't want to make it too easy to use those, though, to like jaunt across the world. Mm -hmm. So cross, you know, crossing, when you cross a walled ford, normally, you appear in the same spot in that other world. Mm -hmm. But to jaunt to a different walled ford, you, one, have to go to, the, to another world, and it takes a lot of magical energy. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we see, like, you know, when Liam does it, it, you know, knocks him for a loop. Yeah. So you want to build things such that, that when the characters need them to be advantageous, it is, but also it can't just be... It, it can't be a, a convenient crutch. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> or at least at the time, you know, maybe they don't know the weakness yet, but there is going to be a weakness eventually that somebody will exploit against them. Right. Well, I mean, you know, Liam didn't know what was going to happen the first time he jaunted. Yeah. So personally for you, when you're building a new world, what, what's your favorite aspect? Like your favorite point that you like to dig, in, dig into? Ooh, it depends on what I'm using it for, really. So for writing? For, for writing, it, it then it hinges on my inspiration. Uh, for example, um, obviously with the Milesian Accords, it was magic. For my uh, Spellpunk world, it was history. For some reason, I became fascinated with uh, New Amsterdam, and I wanted okay, I want monster hunters working out of New Amsterdam. How do I do that? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need for there to be magic. All right, well, how do I do that? Well, hmm. no, I got nothing on that. I got one more. Least favorite thing about world building, or the hardest thing? Keeping track of everything. Yeah. Do you have any tips for that? Yes. Oh, we could um, plug. You have a way to help people. Yes, get the checklist. Yes, you want to tell us a little bit about this. Obviously, this is not going to be super easy to see, but we'll link things. Um, in the back of this book, he has checklists for a couple of different genres, um, and it addresses all of the, the points. And it's a really good way, I think, to start tracking right. things. But this is just a starting point. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you know, for example, there's still times where I have to go back and, does Waldford have a hyphen? Is it italicized? What are we capitalizing? Exactly. That sounds really familiar. Well, there's, there's, and there's not, so then there's naming conventions, style conventions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your style guide is a whole, is a whole thing. And for a shared world, that's a particular, right. you know, that's particularly important because you have to put it all in your Bible and then well, send so it out into the world. To talk about something other than Milesian Accords, that's something I learned in spades with Rules of Engagement in the Four Horsemen universe. Mm -hmm. Which is a, it's an RPG that Oz is working on for right. the Four Horsemen. It's a, a Savage World source book for the Four Horsemen universe, but to have all the world stuff in there, because we want it in addition to being a game book, to be a, a world like source book for fans that oh, don't cool. game. Okay, I didn't know that. So I had to go in and we, we had like a world Bible, but it was written in like 2017. I think Chris talked about it on the one that we did with it. Yeah, there are now 94, almost 94 books in this in this series. So just a few things to remember. Yeah, and there was some stuff that wasn't cover, covered in it. So the authors, because now there's, there's a ton of books, there's a ton of authors. So some of them adhere to certain conventions, some didn't. And so I was trying to like, I'm trying to like collect and homogenize all that. Authors are worse than cats. Yes. Yes, we are. <laughs> if only because when cats are herded, they're like pseudo trying to, to do the right thing, but at the same time, maybe kind of like, well, this seems interesting. Authors are obstinate on purpose. <laughs> or we'd rather take a nap than be productive. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Anything else? Procrastinate task. Yeah. Um, I had something right after that, but it was, it, <clears throat> you, you brought up rules of engagement. Um, one of the things that, you know, Oz and I have in common is that we both kind of started out doing the gaming thing, the, the tabletop RPGs before we got into writing. And so that we've discussed previously, if Oz will agree to come back on eventually, we will likely do another one of those to talk about some of those inspirations and how the world building is different. And there's a lot of cool crossover there too. Yeah. Um, but the, uh, the other thing that I was thinking of is the amount of times that I will shoot you questions, uh, for those who don't know, uh, and this is good. This podcast is going to come out late July, somewhere in August, and my book will have been out for three months. But my first novel in the 4HU will have come out, and I kept shooting Oz questions because I would shoot them to Chris, and I would shoot them to Casey and Mark, and they'd be like, I don't know, ask Oz, because the Bible wouldn't answer a lot of it, but Oz had a lot of that at a lot of the answers. Though. Yeah, you've been collating, collating it all, so, mm -hmm. which is not a small, how, how many words is that right now? Do you know, off the top of your head? I don't know, but I have at least three chapters that are about 35,000 words. Each? Each. Um, and it's a 12 chapter book. Now, some of the chapters are gonna be a lot smaller, mm -hmm. um, but you know, there, there's you know, one chapter that deals with, you know, a bunch of the aliens that we have in the universe. Mm -hmm. There's one that deals with the history of the Galactic Union and the worlds and locations. And there's the one that you know, has all the rules for creating characters. So that has things like talking about the vows assessments, um, the MST track, and then more detail on a set of races that people can play. You know, so that one I actually went to things like naming conventions, things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a chapter that has every mark and every block of Casper specked out yeah. which are mech yes they're they're they're, they're like combat armor suits um so yeah those are some big honking chapters but and and we could delve into probably each of those individually in in another episode so one of the things i think in a lot of writing courses you see um they'll cover this episode is about character and this episode is you know about plot and this is this one is about world building and it's you know 45 minutes or an hour or you go to a writing conference and you take a class or two um, but world building in itself, we can do a whole episode just on aliens, oh, right? Yeah. Um, you know, like we could talk just about magic systems, and we actually we have a hopefully a really exciting guest to talk about magic systems because there's so much there, um, and I think that's part of why we're so excited is to be able to dig into some of these things that people maybe don't think about necessarily as traditionally world building, right. but really like help flesh out and bring stories to life. Yeah. It's also a really cool way to get to hang out with our friends and talk the nerdy shit that we love talking about. Yeah. Right. Hashtag bring Osmore. Yes. That's right. I do it every time. I'm very, I'm very consistent. <laughs> There's one factory kind of thing I left with 35 beers. You did. I was. <laughs> <laughs> Brought 12, left with 35. And they were all different. 
Somehow he had an elf pocket. I don't I don't understand how he did it, but So Imperial Russian Stout was last time and this is very strange. Voodoo brewing. It's very tasty. Out of uh, Meadville, Pennsylvania. Um yeah, and I, I bought it in Virginia Beach. Their the bar there is excellent, so if anyone's in the area, Voodoo Brewing. <laughs> Not a sponsor, but maybe should be. And only if you're 21 or older. <laughs> Speaking of sponsors, if you, uh, if you own a brewery line and you also want to learn how to write and you don't mind sponsoring our podcast, feel free to hit us up. Yeah. We'll talk. Or bring Oz beer. So fun fact, the uh, beer, that, appear, that Liam's favorite beer, mm-hmm. the Harder uh, Stout, is based on a friend of mine who brews beer. As opposed to me using like a real world brand. Mm -hmm. Mm. So it's a personal experience touch there. In fact, I do that for a lot of uh, stuff that I'll Easter egg in people. I knew like a a friend of mine who we were uh, college roommates and we worked at Domino's Pizza together. The pizza, one of the pizza places is named after him. Oh, cool. Okay. They eat pizza a lot in those books. Your Legion Records always makes me hungry. Which is world building. You know, I, if, any, if anyone you know, reads the books, you're going to be like, gosh, this guy's like a, a, a hungry alcoholic. He's always writing about eating and drinking. Oz really likes to eat. Well, yeah, as is obvious. You know. yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's not me writing the books, but I am also one of those. So, you know. Although I choose, I choose the words alcohol connoisseur. Uh, yes. Yeah. Alcoholic would be admitting that I have a problem. This is going to be on the internet. Never <laughs> Authors are, are sometimes drinkers with writing problems. Yeah. Totally. We can blame Ernest Hemingway. People latched onto that quote. And right drunk at it sober. Doesn't work. Yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> you got anything further? Um, I think we're pretty close to wrapping up here. Um, is there anything else specific that you would, would recommend that we touch on um, in the future or things that for new authors you would say that they should pay close attention to when they're starting to do this process? Uh, the big thing is just don't get sunk into the world building trap because mm-hmm. again, it's so much fun. Mm-hmm. Um, and don't spend a lot of time on things that your readers or players are never going to see. Mm-hmm. You know, they, if, if where the, the source of the blue dye comes from for the Royal Toga doesn't matter to the story or the characters, the, the readers don't need to know about it. And you don't need to spend, you know, 10 hours on the internet researching how to make blue dye in the first century AD. I knew I was making a mistake. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm going to point out that by the time this episode airs, you will have probably heard a statement similar to that in almost every episode we've done. Yeah. So if it isn't stuck yet, listen this time. Yeah. It's all so much fun and, and it can be one of the most exciting <clears throat> things, especially if you're writing genre spec fiction, you know, science fiction and fantasy. We fall in love with those worlds, right? We we read about the Shire, you know. We go to Middle Earth, or we look at you know the cool stuff like the uh, the magical ceiling in Harry Potter, and it's those little things that make us want to be more involved in in writing in general. And it's so easy to get lost in it. So this has been a super excellent episode for us. Um, by the time this comes out, I, I may or may not have an announcement. Shady and I have both had the honor recently to work with Oz in writing some things in the Malaysian Accords universe. And so we're intimately familiar at this point with uh, the Bible and a lot of the things that he's been dealing with. I've been sending him millions of questions all the time asking, um, and he really knows his stuff. So I can't recommend enough. Come check out World Building for Novices. Uh, go to his website. Um, we'll sign up for the, his newsletter. The Amazon link for the book. Yes. Yeah, we'll make sure it's all available yeah. to you because they're great resources. And, and John really knows what he's talking about. He's got a ton of experience. So... Yeah, so uh, as we wrap up the show here, we'll, we'd like to thank, you know, again, Nick Thacker and Book Career in a Year uh, and the Book Career in a Year Network for allowing us to continue to host this podcast. Uh, if you're enjoying it, please let us know. If you're not enjoying it, please let us know as well so we can do some stuff to change it. Uh, again, we apologize if we're, if we're a little more mellowed out or if some of our tangents are worse than normal because it's the end of a long con weekend in my, my brain, and I'm sure... The, you know, my, my two uh, friends here are also fried. Um, so if some of the jokes don't land, we'll just chop it up to con jokes and move on. We think we're funny. Yeah. At least I think I'm funny in this moment. And then I'll watch it back, you know, three or four days from now when I'm editing it. And I won't be near as, I won't be near as entertained by the joke. We're funny in another world. <laughs> there you go. We've learned tonight that there are lots of options for that. Yeah, there are plenty. I just got to toss this joke across the across the gap between worlds, and it'll land. Yeah. 
Uh, so I've been, I, you know, I've been your host uh, or co-host, David Shoin. Um, you can find me at davidshoin.com, and uh, I've kind of mentioned it. But one of the one of the cool things that we had come out. What is this weekend, but by the time this podcast comes out is four months ago, is the anthology Paladins of Valor, uh, where we have, all three of us have a Malaysian Accord story uh, coming out in that anthology, and I'll post that link um, in the show notes so you can go check it out, see how that kind of played out. Um, Haley, you want to talk about where they can find you? Um, yeah, I'm Haley H.Y. Gregor, um, hygregor.com, Tobia H.Y. on Instagram, um, H.Y. Gregor author on Facebook. Um, yeah, you can contact me through my website. Pretty cool. easy. Probably have a bio up on Book Career in a Year Network at some point. Um, so yeah. And a big special thank you to our guest, John yes. Osborne. With a lot from us this weekend, we yeah. appreciate it. And you can find me at johnrosborne.com, on Amazon under John R. Osborne, Facebook at John R. Osborne, Instagram at John R. Osborne, Twitter. At Drew Dodds, because it was before I started writing. <laughs> there it is. I really need a bit. <laughs> uh, it happens. Thank you guys again. You know, uh, if there's anything specific you'd like to see, again, you know, like, comment, subscribe. Uh, let us know through via whatever way you're ca- catching podcasts, because this podcast should go out everywhere you can get podcasts. And we'll see you next time. Plancha. <laughs> That was the end of part two of Hashtag Bring On His Beer, where John R. Osborne talked to us about urban fantasy and how he builds worlds when the world's almost pre-built. Thanks again to Book Career Network for hosting us. And again, thanks to you as the audience for stopping by. We hope you enjoyed this episode of World of Sunder. And as always, you can follow the whole cast of characters at the links in the show notes. You should tune in next week as we talk to Clark Rowanson about magic. Finally, make sure you subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. And go ahead and comment for us if you've got questions. As always, thanks for helping us tear the worlds asunder. We'll see you next time.